would like to call the Richmond City School Board to order Monday, April 17th. Madam Clerk. Will the board members who are present please respond. Ms. Doar? Here. Mr. Barlow? Here. Ms. Menz Herb? Here. Mr. Young? Here. Ms. Cosby? She is present. Mrs. Marsh Carter? Here. Ms. Owen? Here. Dr. Sapini? Here. Ms. Page? Here. And we've been joined by our student, Mr. Colby? Here. Next item. The next item is the Pledge of Allegiance followed by a moment of silence. The next item, Madam Chair, is 1.04, the adoption of the agenda, and I do have several changes um, to move the presentation from J. Sergeant Reynolds Community College to follow recognitions. 5.06 is to be removed. I do not have any budget transfers and add approval of the Head Start budget as 5.06. Those are the only changes I have in this room. So Ms. Lewis, mm -hmm. question. So the Head Start budget, why is that being added now? Um, we got a request to add this um, on an agenda and it was not added to this one. So just a reminder to me that it had not been I move that we approve the agenda as amended. Is it moved by Ms. Owen and seconded by Ms. Doar to approve the agenda agenda as approved? Amended, I'm sorry. As amended. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Seeing that we have none. The agenda has been amended. The next item is recognition, and we have three recognitions this evening. Board members and those in attendance, uh, we'd like to take this opportunity to present several certificates. Uh, first is a certificate of appreciation. This certificate is awarded to Paulette Hall for serving as a student uh, representative to the school board for the city of Richmond for the month of March in the year 2017. Is Ms. Hall present? She's not able to make it. Uh, you, yes, sir. Next recognition is for Jordan Colden, a 12th grade student at George With High School. Uh, Jordan is graduating from George With High School with a cumulative GPA of 4.23 and is the school's valedictorian. <laughs> Jordan serves as a president of the National Honor Society, a member of the National Technical Honor Society, and a National Society of High School Scholars. Aside from academics, he also leads uh, as the percussion section leader at the Bulldog Express Marching Band. He's a member of the boys varsity basketball team and track and field teams. He has been accepted to Hampton University, the Virginia State University, Alabama A&M University, and Hampton Sydney College. 
As mentioned uh, previously, uh, he plans to attend Morehouse College and major in biomedical engineering. And just wanted to repeat and recognize him again uh, from last meeting, but also share that uh, he has a class tonight, so he'll be departing about 7 uh, p.m. So when he leaves, that's why, so everyone is aware. At this time, as part of that uh, recognition you again, we want to present to you a certificate of appreciation uh, for serving as a student representative to the school board for the city of Richmond in the month of April in the year 2017. Could you please stand and wave at yes. us? Well, we wish you well and much success. Uh, Madam Chair and Clerk, I understand our other student is on the way, so at some point, uh, if we can pause in between uh, one of the agenda items to recognize that student once they get here. Before we get started, we would just like to thank Dr. Rose and his staff for affording us the opportunity for this tour and to strengthen the partnership for J. Sergeant Reynolds and to expand opportunities for our young people. We are really excited. So again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Page and board members. It's great to have you here, Dr. Benton and staff. Uh, first of all, the college is 45 years old. To my knowledge, I'm in my 15th year here as president. To my knowledge, this is the first time that we've ever had the Richmond Public School School Board on campus for one of the, your meetings and to take a tour. So I want to thank you for that. And when I discussed it with uh, Dr. Bedden, he thought it was a great idea. So Dana, thank you for making it happen as well. Um, our college has 15 board members appointed by the, uh, in the case of the city, the city council, and then by the counties. We serve five counties, Henrico, Goochland, Powhatan, uh, Louisa, and then um, Hanover, and then the city of Richmond. And two of our city-appointed board members are here tonight. I'd like to introduce them, Brenda Drew and Trip Cash. If you could please stand. Thank you for your service to the city. <laughs> and then I'm going to um, introduce some staff, but I want to make a comment first, uh, because if there's one fact that I can leave all of you with tonight that I would guess, other than staff, and Dr. Benton has probably heard me say this, um, it's the most impressive fact about J. Sarger Reynolds that I know of, and that is that one out of every four workers in the greater Richmond region, one out of every four workers, has attended Reynolds Community College, and one out of every three healthcare workers. So if you don't remember anything else from tonight from our college folks, well, you need to hear what Miles and Minnesota have. But um, to me, that's a very, that's a wow factor, and the fact that so many of those students come from uh, Richmond Public Schools is great, too. So regarding staff, we have Dr. Janine LaRosen, our Executive Vice President, Dr. Rosen. And then you're going to hear from Dr. Miles McCrimmon, who is the Director of the College Academy, and Ms. Helena Billis, who is the Director of K-12 Coaching and Recruitment. And they're going to talk tonight about the College Connection Academy, which is one of the many partnerships that we have with Richmond Public Schools. It's a great success, and I think a great role model for the rest of the county and the state of the country. So I'll turn it over to Miles and Pullman. Good evening, folks, and thank you again for coming around. We really feel that. As Dr. Rose said, I'm 
Miles Brooker, and I'm the director of the College Academies at Wells, and with me is Hilda Phillips, our director of K-12 Coaching and Recruitment. And we're here tonight just to give you an update and a little bit of an introduction, in some cases, to our Early College Academy, which is our partnership with Richmond Public Schools. It takes place right here on this campus, downtown campus, every morning, Monday through Friday, and it began uh, last August. So we have our first cohort of students um, matriculating with us as juniors, as 11th graders, <coughs> taking the first of two years' worth of college coursework full-time and leading to the uh, earning of an associate's degree concurrent with high school graduation. And as a matter of fact, a little bit earlier than high school graduation because of the way the calendars are laid out. Um, these students, 27 of them, will be um, eligible to graduate with that associate's degree in social sciences. I'll tell you a little bit about why we chose that degree program in a second. Uh, at the Siegel Center, May of 2018, with the general population of Reynolds adult graduates, and then about three or four weeks later, they'll be graduating from their RPS high school with their high school degree. You have in front of you a handout that I provided, I hope all of you, I think, before you came home. Um, and I'd like to take you through that a little bit and for the uh, for the, uh, for the assemblage behind me, we do have a few more copies of that after the presentation if you're interested and you'd like to take one home with you. And we certainly would love for you to visit our website as well to get more information. But the basic design of this uh, program is it is on our campus and taught by our college faculty. So the students from RPS are bused here every morning and sent back to their home high school by midday. Um, and that design has allowed us to develop a cohort of faculty here who are devoted to the success of these students and just the support of these students. And so far, we are uh, on our way, as I said, to graduating 27 students. A new cohort has been identified for the class of 2019. And I want to thank, actually, the other Dr. Rhodes, besides our own Dr. Rhodes. Dr. Eric Rhodes from RPS has been working closely with us to help identify that next cohort of 50 students in the class of 2019. So they'll be joining the 27 students when they're seniors and these 50 juniors will join them uh, next year on this campus. This starts a little bit earlier uh, than your school year does because we need that extra time to be able to deliver the instructional minutes. And also with this second cohort, we're gonna start with a boot camp of delivery of pretty much half of our orientation a couple of days before our classes even begin here on August 21st. So this program will start on August 17th for these students and then run all the way through, as I said, early May when we're finished as, as seniors. For the juniors, as you'll see on the back of your sheet, if you want to look at the, um, the schedule and, and the course offerings, we have what we call a Maymester for the juniors that, that runs actually from the end of our spring semester here on campus through the end of your school year. So that as juniors, when they're not um, pressing to finish in time to graduate uh, and, and walk the Siegel Center floor for the first of two times, we actually have that five or six week period to work with them and, and squeeze in another um, four credit hours. But as you'll see from the backside, it's a rigorous program of essentially the, probably the 60 most common college credits that you could possibly need regardless of major. This is a decision we made early on so as not to pigeonhole these students into a certain major going down the road. And, and, and make no mistake, this is definitely a program designed for college transfer, transfer to colleges and universities. We chose this program out of our transfer offerings strategically so that we would put these students in a position to be able to major in virtually anything uh, they desire to major in. And, and we know this from an experience, uh, an experience that we've developed with our advanced college academies, which began with Henrico County in 2011 and have since spread to Goochland and Powhatan and Hanover counties. That model, which I'll call the ACA for clarity versus the ECA, that model does take place in the high school setting and is taught by high school teachers who have the Reynolds credentials, the SACS required credentials to teach the coursework. So that's a different model from what we're doing here with the ECA. But we do know from our experience of having actually already produced 73 graduates in the first two years of the ACA that colleges and universities are looking at these graduates uh, very closely and very eagerly, and they are being recruited um, aggressively. And that goes actually for the ECA as well. We just had the other night, uh, transfer night, and a special session specifically for the ACA and the ECA students, and had a good turnout from our Virginia 
colleges and universities, both public and private. And we know from our data from our ACA graduates that 83% of our graduates had transferred successfully 45 or more of these credits that they've earned in the ACA program. We have confidence that the ECA transfer rate will be as great or even higher because it is taking place, after all, on our college campus with our college faculty. So this is a program that clearly is designed to give the graduates a, as much as a two-year head start toward that baccalaureate degree, which gives them what we call the gift of time. It allows them to really think about how they want to use those traditional four years, let's say, in a college university setting to double and triple major, possibly do a combined bachelor's and master's degree. Now with that in mind, we have to work really hard to prepare the students to leave us essentially functioning, ready to perform in 300 and 400 level college coursework as 18 year olds. So we take that mission very seriously, we take that responsibility very seriously, and as a result of that, we've developed a very um, hands-on career coaching system and I talk about that a little bit, and I'd like to actually turn it over to, to Hilda for a few minutes to talk a little bit about the, the Reynolds career coaching in the Richmond Public Schools, and then I'll come back around and, and wrap things up and sort of leave some time for questions. Hilda, tell us a little bit about the coaching. Thank you, Miles. Uh, thank you, board, for inviting us tonight. If you look at your appendix, you'll see the first paragraph talks about our career coaching in the RPS high schools. I'm excited to tell you that we have more high school career coaches serving students in the city of Richmond than any other county in our service region. Uh, there are five high school career coaches assigned to students in the city of Richmond. Two of those career coaches are specialists and so they work with students in the early college academy. One works with students in academic settings here on the campus while they're here at Reynolds and one travels actually to each of the high schools that the students come from and she meets with those students in their high schools and helps those students to develop their career plan for after they leave Reynolds. What are they gonna do with these credits that they've amassed here at Reynolds? And then we also have three career coaches that we call generalists. And these career coaches work with any high school senior who has a GPA of less than 3.0, and that career coach helps those students to identify the career path for that student. And so often those high school career coaches, those generalists, work with students to discover gender underrepresented career pathways, help them to discover pathways available here at the college, such as those that you saw tonight on your tour, and help them to decide how they will finance those opportunities. And so those generalists are assigned to Armstrong High School, John Marshall High School, and Huguenot High School. Mal. And there are many options then for the students as they leave this program, including coming back to Reynolds and actually earning uh, one of the degrees of the type that you saw on the tour. As you can see even from what was handed out to you on the fifth floor, uh, even something like a medical terminology degree requires a fair, a fair amount of gen, general education coursework, which they would be completing through this program. But primarily, the kind of career coaching that these students are getting now, both in the morning and the afternoon, in the schools and here on, on campus, is the kind of thing that uh, you're well aware uh, families often pay a great deal of money for just to be able to get the kind of one-on-one -on -one coaching about even what kind of college to be looking at, much less what sort of major to look at. And that starts really as this program matures and we're able to identify the cohort as we have now for the class of 2019, that career coaching really starts in the spring of 10th grade as they're preparing to come here in the following August. And we're very committed to why the ACA has been so successful, I think, is, is largely as a result of really three things, three C's, if you will. The cohort, the idea of a cohort of students is a very powerful idea that we take very seriously because they can, they can help each other up, they can lift each other up and motivate each other. The coaching that Hilda's talked about and the completion agenda, not the, the idea of going beyond just taking a, a bucket of credits here, here and there and then seeing what you can do with it later but actually having a program and a degree that these students are aiming for is a very important part of the program. So I would be remiss in, in closing my part in not mentioning Appendix B as well. We do have other dual enrollment, non-ECA offerings that many, I think close to 200 RPS students are taking, and you can see the pie chart that was put together by my colleague, Charlie Peterson, Director of Dual Enrollment, uh, and you can see what some of those offerings are and where they, uh, the schools where they're reaching. 
And the final point I'd like to make, uh, just to continue the, uh, the hospitality that we've been trying to provide for today is next Monday night, uh, shortly, uh, a little bit after uh, about a half an hour and a week from now, we're going to have our first ECA tending ceremony convocation ever, first annual, to celebrate those 27 students and their accomplishment thus far in the program. Dr. Redden, I know I've seen an RSVP from you. We're looking forward to having you there next week. And several others of you, I think, have also RSVP. I know mean, you've been invited by, by your Dr. Rose. I even have a few more invitations over there alongside the handouts. You're more than welcome to take one extra if you need, or even somebody out here. It is certainly open to the public, and it's going to be a nice celebration, cake and punch, and the actual unveiling of the first ever ECA lapel pen, which each of you, I can assure you, will, will receive. Uh, attendance is mandatory. But we would love to have you next Monday. And it's up at the Living Auditorium on the Paramount campus as well. So if there's time permitting, um, we'd be happy to take questions or any um, comments. I have a question. Uh, thank you so much for this. Very exciting. I think we talked We did talk to the teacher. Uh, yes. And I just think it's wonderful. Um, the students that are going to come in the next cohort, mm -hmm. are they representative of all of our high schools? Yes, I believe that's right, Dr. Rose. I think we have representation from each from the first cohort on the second application. From the second floor, I think it's now, now represents all of us. Okay, thank you. You bet. This might be already in here, but... Sorry. What is the... Uh, Two-part question. What are the requirements mm -hmm. for students? And is there an ideal student that you're looking for as you're looking for applications? And actually, Dr. Rogers, you can chime in on this if, if you like. But what we have done with the second floor especially is we've actually instituted and I should say RPS as instituted because technically the admissions decisions in the ECA and the ACA is really the, it's your decision, it's the, it's the school division's decision. We are an open admissions institution, so we rely on you to make the, to go through the vetting process. And I do know that in the class of 2019, they've added a few extra layers of scrutiny, some letters from teachers and counselors, uh, GPA requirement an essay. We added an essay that we have used now for years in the ACA that really asks the 10th grade applicant to uh, be reflective about the habits of mind that they've already developed and what they feel like they need to develop. So um, we have, um, and we're just investing as well, of course. But the idea is we want to be ready to take our uh, Virginia placement test in English. Uh, in fact, their, their acceptance to the program is provisional upon passing math that's coming up for this next class on April 22nd. And the ideal student, that's a great question. I, I often characterize the typical ECA or ACA student as being, um, and this might be uh, redundant, but sort of almost preternaturally mature for their age. I mean, I don't think they have to be a brainiac, but I think they need to be somebody who's already thinking as a 16 and 17 year old. On the way to thinking like a 20 year old at the time they leave the program, that's just the reality. And we do know our graduates certainly act that way when they get to the four-year college in the ACA. They, they become the leaders of their dorms and suites and, and campuses. Ms. Marsh Carter. I just wanted to commend on the coaching component. Having, um, a few years ago, taken classes at JSR when I finished my high school courses, but it really was kind of a boundary. Right? You know, just what was available and fill up some time. This is really the most people to approach. And I hope we can expand the opportunities uh, for all kids I'd like to echo that. I think it's it's really incredible that we've got students who can graduate with as many credits as, uh, as they're able to obtain here, and I hope that we can uh, continue our partnership and expand on it. I'm sad I couldn't make it to the uh, to the tour today, but hope to come by soon for uh, for another one. So thank you very much for all the work you're doing. Mr. Young.
so much for giving us the time. We look forward to your support. Yes. <coughs> well, I just want to take this time to circle back and recognize uh, our student from this evening. As many of you have probably heard, we have had the pleasure of having a student that demonstrated significant care and concern for the well-being of one of their guardians. Uh, during this uh, unfortunate incident, uh, our student demonstrated a significant concern for the well-being of one of their guardians in lieu of their own concern and risk their own life for the life of another. At this time, and I know Ms. Page may want to share a little bit more, and of course, we have our team, students have said words, uh, Probably should have happened sooner. Uh, we did try to uh, bring the student forward in another opportunity earlier, and I'm glad you're feeling better. Uh, we want to take this opportunity to present a certificate of appreciation. Uh, this certificate is being awarded to Elijah Johnson in recognition of your unselfish act of heroism uh, for taking care of your grandmother. Is that correct? And if you have not heard the story read about it, uh, Elijah risked his life to protect his grandmother sustained several uh, significant uh, injuries and wounds that required him to be in the hospital. So we want to thank you for stepping forward and doing something, an uh, unselfish act to protect someone else <coughs> without regard for your own safety and well-being. So this time we come forward. student athlete. When I say a big heart, he has a big heart. And his actions spoke to it. Just so glad to see you. Thank you. And I know uh, the principal's here also, so you know Elijah, or if you'd like him to speak and share any thoughts about you, it's we'll defer to you. <laughs> well, uh, Elijah and I got to know each other really quick right at the beginning of the year. He walked by and uh, his smile was so big I couldn't help but shake his hand. I didn't even know who he was and I, just, I got to shake your hand. You got a big smile. And uh, as a former athlete and former coach, I take my son to lots of sporting events. And he is a football player, but he's only 11 years old. And we were at uh, one of our first games of the season. He, he's never been a linebacker. He's a little kid. And he's looking out on the field, he's watching, and he's going, Dad, which one of those players out there do you think I play like? And I said, I don't, I don't know. Which one do you think? And he said, I think I play like him. And I go, well, someday. <laughs> and he said, well, he's my new favorite player. So at the end of the game, uh, came down and uh, got to meet him. And when he heard about what happened, he said, uh, you need to tell him that he needs to get up off the ground just like he did in that game and, and go back and get in the huddle. And uh, he does that every day. He came back to school very quickly. And he is a heartbeat of our school, not just because of the hero heroism he showed there, academically, athletically, and personality. Uh, the kids in the school love him, and they were very concerned about him when this all happened. And, uh, it's going to be sad to see him graduate, but it's going to be great to see him graduate, too. But um, he's made a, a lot of people love him this year, and it's very great to get to see him get on him. Thank you. You're not shy. Very shy. Can you stand up? <laughs> uh, I just appreciate the award. You know, um, this is very embarrassing to be on. Um, <laughs> I don't know, it's just, just still so love around the support. You know, I have much family, so this is very nice. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 
recognize your friend? Yeah, this is my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Her name? Her name is Kiana Briefly. <laughs> Chairperson Page and Dr. Benton, members of the school board. My name is Bob Artigright, and I was here approximately four weeks ago to talk to you about my concerns about Oak Grove Bellmead. I said at that time that I felt like personally that Oak Grove Bellmead had gone backwards in the 13 years that I've been there. And there's reasons for that. Uh, in the recent rezoning, which was four and a half years ago, the demographics of Oak Grove changed dramatically. So that's one thing to look at. The second thing was we had a principal who had been with Richmond Public Schools for 28 years. Um, she had done an outstanding job at Oak Grove Bellmead. She had installed a culture that it was based on making children feel like that they belong in that school. Um, she also, had she and her husband, Eric Larson, had really talked about traumatized children for, for a long time. Ten years ago, every one of our teachers had gone through the ACE evaluation. Ten years ago, every one of our teachers, faculty, bus drivers, everybody had been through how do you teach and how do you handle children that come out of a traumatized situation. We lost all that. We had a strategic plan that we wanted to implement. We lost that. That's not to point blame at anybody. There's no point in having blame. But what I am here to ask for is help in this. Recognize that Oak Grove Bellmead is a school where change is needed. It's difficult for a teacher to teach a percentage of children who have no interest whatsoever in learning. First of all, you've got to create that interest in learning from my standpoint. Then you can begin. So sometimes we have to take a step backward and figure out how do we create that sense of wanting to learn. The, so that's the first step. These are suggestions. I pointed out an issue, but I don't want to point out issues without saying, here might be some suggestions you might implement. Read the book, Trauma Sensitive, schools, learning communities, and transforming children's lives, K through 55. It was written in September of 2016. It was heralded as a dramatic uh, change. Again, it's painful to see that everything that was written in the book was known 10 years ago and was at Oak Grove 10 years ago. Take the ACE evaluation and realize how much stress and trauma we all suffer in our lives and then realize, again, the kids that are coming to Oak Grove Bellmead suffer a whole lot more trauma than you are going to see. Also, I would encourage you to invite Eric Larson, who is well-known worldwide in trauma. He's written several books. He's on the faculty at U of R. He's teaching a course out there in June. 30 seconds in June, and then invite Jenny Larson here to talk to you. Visit the Ecoff School in, in um, Chesterfield. Visit the Harrisonburg, Virginia School System, see what they're doing, and just recognizing the need for that change in trauma. I've given each one of you a packet of materials, and I've got co content in there, and I'm just asking you to please read and digest that material 
And then again, it would be nice to get some kind of feedback Hi. as to what we're going to do, if anything. Also, there's a letter in there that goes back four years ago, Tom DeBolt, who was the superintendent of Manassas Park Elementary, saying four years ago what a dramatic loss Jenny Larson was going to be, and that's proven to be so. So thank you so much, and uh, I'm going to leave these uh, materials for you. There's enough for Dr. Bedden, uh, Ms. Payne, uh, Dr. Leonard, and each one of the school board members. Thank you. Mr. James Minor. Mr. James Minor. That concludes the list of speakers who signed up in advance, Madam Chair. If we have other members in the audience that would like to come up for the board to speak during this time, please come forward. Sign in and state your name. <coughs> Good evening, board members, Dr. Bed. My name is Candace Lucas. I'm with Advocates for Equity in Schools, uh, organization that combats school push-out, and I do have some handouts for you. Jordan, it's good to see you. It's good to see that you're one of the black men that made it out of Richmond City Public Schools alive. I'm proud of you, son, and proud of your dad, too. Um, I have handed out to you two items, the first item, and I get five minutes just to make sure we understand that piece. Uh, it's the article that was published today in the Richmond Times uh, Dispatch or Richmond.com, U.S. Department of Education launches a civil rights probe into Richmond City Schools, which is long overdue. Um, I've also included in the packet a copy of the uh, most recent assessment of Richmond County, of Richmond City Public Schools by the Virginia Department of Education regarding the indicators as it pertains to special education and how Richmond City Schools continues to fail in that area, it needs assistance. It should be two separate pack, should be a, a packet stapled together. Can we keep it passing on? Oh, okay. Um, and basically what I'm here to talk about is that the violations that are going on in here in our Richmond City Public Schools are intentional, they're systemic, and it's a culture. If you look on the third paragraph in the article by the Richmond Times Dispatch, it states of the complaint filed by uh, Legal Justice Aid and ACLU and, and uh, NAACP, it states in a 28-page indictment of the division's practices submitted then lawyers of two named students detail inconsistencies arising from, from subjective interpretations of the student code of conduct lawyers describe as disorganized and internally inconsistent assortment of narratives, lists, and charts. And that is correct. Right now I'm in the middle of a uh, due process hearing with the city in which your policies were not followed. You know, people are telling you to read the trauma-informed uh, information, which is true, but you need to read your code of conduct. You need to read your code of conduct. Your, your administrators are not following it. Your central office staff is not following it. Um, and in addition to that, you're being coached by Har Harold Chambliss on how to violate the law. You need to get your contract with the law firm immediately. They're, they're causing you guys a lot of taxpayers' dollars, and they're advising you how to violate the law. We should not be using taxpayers' dollars to teach you guys how to abuse our children. And that's what Janelle Lilly is doing. That is what Nicole Thompson is doing. They're directing you on how to violate the law. And they're violating the law themselves by covering up information and covering up illegal practices and operating outside of their own ethical standards. So I'm going to be pushing that issue along with our national organization to make sure that Harold and Chang Changless, their contract is discontinued with the, with the district. You need lawyers that have integrity, and these are just law firms don't. This law firm does not. And I have ample documentation to prove that. You need to dis discontinue the pol your contract with them, your retainer with them, because we don't need anyone who's not going to support our children. Deciding to support our children should not be a choice that educators have to make in this district. We have an uh, administrator who clearly wanted to make sure that a child's needs were met, but had to choose between their job 
and doing what was ethically correct. And that should never be a choice for an educator. I'm a licensed educator and a licensed administrator with the state of Virginia. I know what our ethical requirements are. And when we have a culture in which educators and administrators have to choose between keeping their job and being ethical, this is not the environment that we want to cultivate. We need a change, and it starts by getting rid of this law firm immediately. In addition to that, I'm going to close by stating this. Once again, we have two, uh, two police officers, security officers on the side of anyone who comes up to make public comment. When J. Sergeant Reynolds came up here to make their presentation, they didn't come. This is an intimidating act, and it needs to stop. We don't need security up here. What are you going to do if I keep talking? Turn off the mic? That's the worst you can do. We don't need security on both sides of us. It is, it is, it is, it, it is completely intimidating, and it needs to stop. In addition to that, utilizing security to stop, us, to stop us from reviewing records, to stop us from coming to meetings. What is this, the Gestapo? I'm meeting, I'm met by individuals, Dr. Bad, you sent the head of security to sit at the table while I reviewed a record, a record of a confidential student. You did that, he admitted, Dr. Mr. Mallory stated you did, I have it on audio. You told that head of security to come and sit at the table with me, next to the student. Time. That is an intimidating tactic, and it needs to stop. You need to stop being a vote. Thank you. Especially when uh, I'm waiting, I'm gonna have Miss Buffalo at the next meeting. But she told, I told, I relayed her lessons from Miss Cosby. She's gonna wait for the talk to her. But ultimately, seeing what her son has went through, being an exceptional head, special needs child, to get his mouth to take, and nothing was done about, it. absolutely nothing. And the teachers are still in the building. That is disturbing. And that young man talks about that every time he sees me. When I go to the barber shop, every time I see, see um, you know, uh, you know, my teacher's shop take my mouth shut. That that is that is disturbing. And they keep telling me, "Well, you know, you're still working." And his mom's going to relate it. She's going to relate it. But the last time I went to the barber shop, he just told me that again. You know, call the teacher by name, and nothing, nothing was done. And still, nothing was done. That teacher should not be there. He's a sexual aide. I mean, severely exceptional. It ain't no, ain't no if, ands, or buts about it. He's severely exceptional. It's not, it's not one of those things. It's those things where he, he has to, he has a real learning disability, and they allow this teacher to tape his mouth shut. They didn't give him any, you didn't give him any counseling. This is one of a whole year. This parent keep continues to call the school to try to get something. With he even called Dr. Begg's office. No, no phone call return or anything. And she's going to verify that when she comes back. But she didn't have no babysitter, so she couldn't get there. But I see this, this kid, I see him every day, or mostly when I go to the bar shop, very close. And he think, you know, because I got him in school the last time when he didn't get the T dot shot, he think that I'm the one that can help him get over this. And it's, it's concerning to me that the school system allowed that and then didn't do anything about it. And still, when I reported the last time, they still didn't do anything about it. They didn't even try to even reach out to the mother, try to find out about the anything. He just let it go. 
And this is the, the disconnect that this administration has with exception ed issues that they don't, they don't speak to, and it's just a big disconnect with the whole community. This man don't care about his children. He don't. He really don't. He can care less. He didn't even show up to the state championship game with the um, when, when he won state championship. He didn't even show up. He didn't show up to the Hall of Fame um, back. As anything that goes on in Richmond Public Schools that is of importance, you don't see him but when it's time to speak, when he needs to do the state of address, whatever he's there. But when it comes to these children the issue, I don't see him. And this administration is very disconnected from this community. And we need to do that can actually be care for our children and be responsive to these parents and the needs of the community. Thank you. Thank you. If we have no one else to come forward, this concludes the public information period. Next item. The next item on the agenda is item five, your board actions. 5.01, receive for action the 2017-2018 school calendar. draft 2017-2018 uh, <coughs> district calendar. <coughs> the calendar committee met twice before the presentation to the school board on March 20th. The meetings were held on February 22nd and March 1st. The calendar committee discussed a variety of calendar related issues including uh, congruence with neighboring school districts calendars, uh, required cal calendar uh, constraints, amongst others, uh, student absenteeism on early dismissal days. Uh, this year, the absenteeism on early, dis on early release days ranged from 9.6% to 11.5%, uh, whereas absenteeism on full days uh, was about an average of 6.4%. And so that, that impacted or was reflected in the, the initial draft proposed calendar that we received on March 20th. Uh, proposed draft uh, was presented, as I, as I mentioned, on, on the 20th. Following the school board meeting, the proposed draft calendar was posted on the RPS website to collect public comment. Approximately 370 comments were received from a variety of stakeholders. The comments uh, uh, ranged from um, you know, in all aspects of the calendar, uh, the early release days, uh, professional development days, and, and holiday arrangements, and, and so on. The calendar committee met again on April 6th to discuss the comments and come up with uh, a recommendation. The proposed draft calendar on the agenda this evening includes grouping district-wide professional development days at the beginning of the year, um, to, to maximize school-based efforts. Uh, adjustments were made to the proposed calendar to provide additional early release days, um, uh, such as the one added to the end of the first semester. So if you take a look at the, the calendar that you have in front of you, you can see that from the first, from the first draft to this draft that I'm asking you to approve this evening, um, the first day of, of teachers returning would be on August 23rd rather than on August 22nd. Uh, you can also see that there have been some adjustments in the number of early release days, so an increase in the number of early release days to reflect uh, the allowance for, for planning and preparation at the end of uh, an interim or the, the nine-week marking period. And uh, those, are, those are predominantly uh, most of the changes. I'd be happy to entertain any questions that you have regarding the calendar. Mr. Young. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Rose, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> would you please share with us how many professional development days are included in the calendar, sir? So the number of professional development days are included in the calendar. The total 
uh, professional development days are over of, of five PD days. But, but the one PD day um, at the beginning of the year that is a, is a district rally. So the teachers would return back to their schools after that. Ms. Dorr? Are the, the circles are teacher work days, professional development, and meetings? Are, so are those not is, professional development, or are they? They're, they're not. I mean, they, so those are school-based days. That's up to the discretion of the school principal to use those days as, as work days, um, professional development, or, or any combination of the sort. So for instance, when, when we return back to school in August, you know, they may have a, um, a faculty meeting to start off in the morning. They may have a short professional development and then you know, release the teachers back to their classrooms to, to you know, prepare for the meetings. So that is a misconception that came up in those 370 comments. The circles, um, because uh, when, you, when you look at the circle and the legend down below, PD is identified in that. One of the misconceptions that came up was the, um, the, the notion that, that that's strictly for professional development. Um, so, I, thank you for the clarification. I think there's still a bit of confusion with the public. I know I've received a good number of emails. <laughs> um, I, I personally would like um, a chance to work session this out just a little bit so that we can make sure that all the feedback that we've received um, is incorporated in the calendar. And not to push the can down the road a little bit, but if, the, if it's the will of the rest of the board, I think it'd be good to talk it through as a group. Mr. Okay. Young. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was prepared to vote against this calendar this evening, particularly because of the concerns that I, uh, I suspect that Liz is referring to, that Ms. Dorr is referring to, and, uh, and I share those same concerns. Uh, but uh, I think that what uh, our good colleague from the first recommends makes a lot of sense, and perhaps, uh, perhaps if there is an opportunity, but I would like to <coughs> would like to hear from Dr. Rhodes and Dr. Bedden um, in regards to that chronology and what time, what timeline we need. Madam Chair. Yes. Can we, yes. Dr. Bedden, can we take a break so that our student representative can leave us? Thank you again and good luck. Yes. Dr. Kane, were you going to speak to the challenge of potential of delay? Do you want me to speak to it? Well, you can speak to the challenge of the delay, Dr. Bevin, but what I was just going to add is that the professional development days are distinguished. We distinguish those by district-wide professional days and school-based professional development so that the school-based days are a combination. They're professional development, they're teacher work days, they have faculty meetings, they have staff meetings, all of those things that need to be taken care of at the school level. So sometimes professional development is offered at the school level that sort of comes down from the district or is based off of priorities from the district but are focused on what that school really does need. So the school can determine what professional development, the sequence of professional development, but that is included in there. And then there's a, a professional development day again in, um, in February. So the need for professional development I think is clear. Um, I'm wondering what the, if there is confusion, what the confusion is about, is it about the distribution of the days? Mr. Barlow? I haven't spoken yet. I think, uh, yeah, that, that's part of the confusion for me. Uh, I, I would think that we'd want to build in some time and, and let me know if this has been accounted for. Uh, building some time uh, before grades are due to allow teachers the opportunity to, to work, some paid time there. So uh, can you discuss how you envision that playing out? Absolutely, and that's what Mr. Rhodes spoke about when we added back. Last year we had a, a two-hour early dismissal at the end of every marking period, which allowed teachers an opportunity to continue or to finish tabulating grades, to make any comments that they needed, if they needed to send comments, interim reports home, all of those kinds of things in having conversations with multiple groups at the beginning of the year. We found that te some teachers wanted to uh, get rid of those 
to our early dismissals because as Dr. Rose shared, there are issues with attendance, not only student attendance, but sometimes teacher attendance. And so the proposal at that point was to remove those. Once we put the calendar up for that 30-day public comment, we found that there was more support to have that two-hour early dismissal put back in for every marking period. We left two for the first proposal, but then after the second opportunity and we had that public comment, we made sure that every marking period had those two-hour early dismissals placed back in there. And that is what you see for teacher work day. So we allow that opportunity to continue to tabulate grades and those things that teachers need to finish doing at the end of the marking period. So you will find for this proposed calendar that those two hour early dismissal days are for every marking period, as was the general consensus for the request at the, uh, for the public comment. Uh, so what you're saying, you're saying that when you have the two hour early dismissals, that you have issues with attendance pertaining to students that are just don't come in because yeah, so to, as well as uh, educators who don't come in? You're correct. So the statistics that Mr. Rhodes gave is that we found on days where there were two hour early dismissals and that's whether or not it was at the end of the market period or what, but the attendance is, is poor. Okay, so we have a higher rate of absenteeism on two hour early dismissal days than we do on full school days. And that's the statistics that Mr. Rhodes was sharing with you. So for two hour early dismissal days, it ranged from about 9.6 or 9.4 or so to about 11% of our students who were absent that day. Whereas any general, we pulled random full school days and that attendance averaged out at about 6% absenteeism. So clearly there was a difference on the two hour early dismissal days than on the regular full days. However, when we put the calendar out for public comment, there was still a greater support for those two hour early dismissals. And it could very well be that the folks who responded were you know, teachers or parents or whoever may have been that wanted to have those two hour um, early dismissals. And so that's why you have the proposal that we've shared today. Dr. Bay. So, the, as Ms. Kane laid it out, I do want to connect a dot for you. There's a proposal right now for accountability for VDOE. Chronic absenteeism may be the variable that's added in for accountability purposes. When you start hitting that higher number, it's going to automatically push us into another accountability category. So that was also the factor of thinking and looking at the data about the attendance rates because it brought to our attention by a number of principles that so they actually did, I think you moved the day also. So even when we put it back in, they tried to pay attention to what day of the week it was to try to help reduce that, that large increase. But when you start hitting, you go from six to nine to 11 point something, almost 12%, I think it was. That's huge. And that's an average of the district. I will tell you that some of the more challenged schools were double digits, you know, easily 12 to 15% of their population. So that was, uh, part of the challenge. And we know right now that the way VDOE is heading for the new accountability system for ESSA, chronic absenteeism is one, gonna be one of the accountability measures that's factored in. And those absences will count against us also. Ms. Dorr? Was there talk at all, I, I received some feedback that just to make it a full work day as opposed to a two hour early dismissal, was there, was there talk of potentially exploring adding a full work day at the end of the marking period? Specifically. No, there wasn't a there wasn't a um, significant discussion around that. But remember, I mentioned the constraints that we have to work in, and that's uh, 180 instructional days. And so we're 990 hours. So every time you take right. the students out, you're subtracting from that, and you're also pulling away from our cushion for snow days and other things. So and we also factor in. We're trying to also stay in the districts, the divisions across the region. Try to stay somewhat. They don't match up totally but somewhat consistent also with their, how they do their calendar also. Ms. Cosby. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I would like to, I too have some concerns about this calendar, primarily because I can't see what was proposed before and what we were able to compare it to now, and especially as it relates to some of the comments that I know I received and my colleagues have one second, if we can talk about the viability of us postponing um, voting tonight, how much time do we have? Because you mentioned there are some time constraints or some time issues, so it's someone who's going to do that. 
Well, I can tell you that the surrounding districts have their calendars posted already. We have tried to allow for ample opportunity for public comment, um, and I think that we have done that. So at this point, we're already late. So I think it will be uh, at the will of the board. You guys will have to probably make some decision as to when it is. Obviously, the closer we get to uh, the school year, um, the, the more antsy you know, our community is going to get because they really would like to know what schools are doing for the school year coming up. And, and teachers as well, because we need to plan for professional development and that sort of thing. Dr. Ben, and then I have a question. And just to follow up with the answer question, I also know that teachers also look at planning their summer, right? So the longer we late, and that's usually generally the feedback you get, and that's in every district I work in. The farther you push it out, it's delaying their planning, their summer travel and their return time, knowing when exactly that's going to be. So is there a drop fast, <clears throat> definitive rule for what is supposed to be done? No, it's a matter of convenience and planning that is factored in for staff and, and families when they plan their trips and you know, those types of things. Um, she's already mentioned we're late compared to our other jurisdictions. Uh, the disadvantage is <clears throat> if you've got something separate and it wasn't inside of the communication tool, we're not sure how to answer those because we weren't aware of those. So we would have actually tried to bring those information points to you to help answer the questions so you could actually meet your timelines. That was the intention of the 30 day I'm not sure why they wouldn't have put it in so they could have factored it in because they took feedback from those people, made adjustments, like the, putting the two hour early dismissal back. That was the purpose of that exercise. Now, we took this to the teacher advisory council, uh, got feedback from them. So student they were gonna, advisory. Uh, student advisory council, the students chimed in at their meetings. So those separate communications, we're not sure, and we probably could have Parent, you did your parent, did yeah, the parent advisory council chimed in uh, to factor all that in to make any true adjustments and or give information to address any confusion because some of it sounds like it's confusing to people. Like the rally was put in back in because of the request of the teachers and the staff. They enjoy it. And we put it back in based on that feedback. The, the, really the way that the professional development days and the orientation days at the beginning of the calendar are grouped was also at request. We got that from public comment because they really wanted to have all of the district days together so that they can have the beginning and the end back in schools. Madam Chair. Ms. Young. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> the preceding conversation prompted another question. That district rally, do we incur costs? And could anyone? Not taxpayer it? dollars, no. Okay. That. We have an outside funding source that's separate from tax dollars that paid for it, and I think it was about $5,000 last year. And for morale purposes and how teachers felt, it was well worth it. Uh, but I was very much a stickler when they asked for it to be back about maintaining the cost factor. And so we use an outside so funding source from tax dollars. Thank you for that. Yeah. So, Dr. Kane, I have a question. Now, I heard you mention that our surrounding localities have already approved their calendar. So my, I have a two-part question. So first, um, what has, I guess, kept, why are we here at this moment? Why, why are we behind in the approving, approval of our calendar? Is so planning? So I'll, I'll refresh the memory of the board because we did explain that the first time that Mr. Rhodes came in front of the board to explain that. And that was because we did have some transition in our leadership. The person who was handling this is no longer the director for curriculum and instruction. There was a lapse in the communication who was responsible to transfer from one office to another office. And so there was a lapse there. And then the groups, the uh, committee needed to be put together. So that's why there was a lapse. So Yes, board remember the reasons why, um, as you just stated, the reason why we received this late. So I guess my question is, knowing that you had those personnel changes, um, and this is under your purview. Academic services, yes. So um, I guess my question is, Knowing that was happening, why 
say you, then you um, take charge in this? I have many responsibilities. I understand that. And so no, I did not pull together this committee, no. But the school calendar, which uh, impacts the entire district, and so being under your purview, um, why, did, why didn't this rise to the bar, upon the priority list? Again, my response is the same. There was a change in responsibilities, and within that change, and then the change in leadership, one office thought that they were in charge of it, and another thought that uh, the other was in charge of it, and so there was a lapse. And I'll take full responsibility for that, as I do for any of the things that the responsibilities that fall under academic services, but that is the response. Okay, I couldn't ask another question, but I'll go on to the next one. So the feedback from teachers, as far as with the two hour workday, as far as um, turning in grades, do you receive feedback or do you have statistics that show teachers that are behind in, in putting, you know, putting, in, putting in grades? Um, do you see the statistics, you know, teachers having problems because of the lack of time to, you know, to prepare to put grades in? Because in other localities, they may have a half a day teacher work day to input grades or a, work, a full work day. So do you receive feedback or do you um, get concerns or feedback from your principals? as far as teachers needing more time to put in their grades? I've not received, last year was the first year that we put the two hour early dismissals into the calendar. We got a lot of comments about, you know, they liked it, but then there were some comments about students don't come to school, you know, as regularly on those days. So it was mixed, but we've not gotten comments about teachers needing more time at this point. So this year, or I should say, next school year would have been the first year without that. Um, but since we proposed to put it back in and we heard greatly from the teachers, uh, 340 some responses, you know, that, res that supported, overall supported, having those, those two hour early dismissals put back in the calendar. But not gotten feedback from principals to say that that's not enough time. And so we are hearing concerns from the board but board members need to keep in mind, we will not be able to approve, if we delay this, we will not be able to approve it until the second meeting in May. So I just want to bring that to your attention. Because first meeting scheduled for work session. So Ms. Lewis just reminded me, if push come to shove, we could vote on it, the first meeting in May, if that's the will of the board. Ms. Cosby and Ms. Abalo. Uh, I have a question about the process. So after you all aggregated all of the feedback and you made changes, was this um, updated version posted again for feedback or no? No, it was returned to the, the calendar committee to review and provide uh, additional recommendations. Ms. Abalo. And so they, were, they reviewed all 370 comments and the statistics that went around those comments. Ms. Abalo. I'm reminded of the old adage that a, a camel is a horse designed by a committee uh, when saying this. Um, I, uh, I understand that you guys have had a lot of stakeholders who have weighed in on this, so um, really appreciate all the work that you've done. I know that establishing that committee and getting 370 people uh, to give feedback and everything along those lines is a lot of work, so um, I want to commend you for all the work that you've done as a, as a newer uh, person to the team, and, and thank you for that. Um, I, I'd also like to, to probably push this back just so we get a, a little more time to digest it. I understand that we've had versions floating back and forth, but I just wanted to thank you for your work.
5.02, receive for action the exceptional education plan. Good evening, school board members, Dr. Benton. Um, I come before you to seek your approval of the annual plan that was shared with you at the March 16th school board meeting, as well as shared via your weekly report. Um, we did share a presentation with you also to highlight the key components of the annual plan. I would like to point out one piece. We will need to modify uh, the one section that asks about interagency agreements since our submission of our annual plan to you, we have since revised our interagency agreement with the Richmond City Jail where we provide special education instruction to those students um, who are incarcerated for brief periods. So we will need to change the no to a yes and also attach our revised MOU with the Richmond City Jail, but that will be the only revision since the time of your review. If you don't have any questions, Ms. Page, I would like to seek approval of the 2017-2018 uh, annual plan with the noted revision. Thank you. Thank you. Need a motion? I move that we accept the plan as amended. Second. I second that motion. It's been moved by Ms. Owen and seconded by Mr. Barlow to accept the action of the exceptional education plan. Ms. Cosby. Next item. The next item is 5.04, receive for action revisions to, I'm sorry, 5.03, receive for action the summer school schedule program. Good evening, Madam Chair, Dr. Bedden, school board members. Bring to you this evening for uh, approval the summer school programs um, based on the, the comments from uh, from the last meeting. I made some some changes to the, the summer school program to indicate the Ocean Adventure exact locations um, per uh, Dr. Sapini's recommendation and uh, the uh, locations of the, the ESL programs that we'll have in the schools. Um, in addition, you can see that there's a range of uh, elementary, middle, and, and high school offerings for our students. As soon as we have your uh, approval, we'll uh, hit the switch and um, we'll start collecting registration for our students. Ms. Owen, you have a question? I was just going to make the motion that we accept the plan. Okay. Need a second? A second. A second. It's been moved by Ms. Owen and seconded by. I got to second the last one, so I'd like to okay, defer to my colleague. Ms. Marsh Carter. Any discussion? Seeing that we have none. Okay, the motion was made by Ms. Owen, seconded by Ms. Marsh Carter to approve the summer school schedule program as amended. Ms. Mans Earl? Yes. Ms. Carter? Yes. Ms. Owen? Yes. Mr. Barlow? Yes. Ms. Dorr? Yes. Mr. Young? Aye. Ms. Cosby? Yes. Dr. Sapini? Yes. Ms. Page? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Next item. The next item is 5.04, received for action revisions to policies 1-5.1, school board committees, and 1-6.1, school board meetings. Excuse me. Uh, 
I'd like to move to approve these policy updates. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Barlow and seconded by Ms. Dewar to receive the action revisions to the policies 1-5.1, school board committees, and 1-6.1 and school board meetings. Any discussion? <coughs> Seeing that we have none. Sorry. Yes. Oh, Ms. Can I ask a question? Question. Yeah. Um, in regards to when things are brought to a vote at a work session, what is the parameter around that given the conversation around the calendar? So the first meeting has been set up to have, to receive reports, a work session. And then the second meeting will be the action meeting. And items for action that come out of the first work first board meeting that will include the work session. Right, I, and I read that you could actually do a vote if necessary at the work session, but what are the parameters to make that decision about what gets moved to a vote so that, that the sessions remain fairly protected the way that they're intended? Do you understand my question? Okay, Ms. Lilly can comment and then I can add to it. Okay, I was gonna offer that um, first just to make sure, sure you're aware your HR actions are always going to be voted on at your work sessions each meeting. Um, and then the parameters, for example, time constraints, for example, the, this issue tonight with the calendar, it would be put you further behind if you waited another two weeks. I think it would be on a case-by-case -case basis that the board would have to determine whether there was some emergent issue that needed to be addressed and voted on that particular night. And that's kind of um, how we've operated prior to when this was implemented. The motion was made by Mr. Barlow and seconded by Mrs. Doar to approve the revisions to the policies as noted. Ms. Owen? Yes. Mr. Young? Aye. Ms. Cosby? Yes. Ms. Menz Erb? Yes. Ms. Carter? Yes. Mr. Barlow? Yes. Ms. Doar? Yes. Dr. Sapini? Yes. Ms. Page? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. The next item is 5.05, .05, Receive for Action and Human Resources Actions. Good evening, Madam Chairwoman, Dr. Benton, school board members. The HR actions for approval tonight are as follows. The nomination of four employees and the change of contract of nine employees. Any questions? I move that we accept this, uh, the human resources actions. I second Ms. Owens. So it's been moved by Ms. Owen and seconded by Mr. Barlow to receive the action from human resources. <coughs> Any discussion? And then we have none. Mr. Young? Aye. Ms. Doar? Yes. Mr. Barlow? Yes. Ms. Owen? Yes. Ms. Carter? Yes. Ms. Menz Erb? Yes. Ms. Cosby? Yes. Dr. Sapini? Yes. Ms. Page? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Um, the next item is 5.06, Receive for Action the Head Start Budget. <coughs> early head start so I'm here today to get your approval for our early head start head start budget application um, for the 2017-2018 school year Ms. Owens was available to sit on the policy council level for that budget committee meeting um, but the federal government just requires that I get the entire board's approval so I think you guys have some information in front of you if you have any questions and Ms. Owens also can probably speak to a little. 
of what you sent in on the budget committee. Ms. Owen? I can't, there's a lot of work that went into this and it's a level funding. Um, so they had to really make some adjustments because personnel costs go up, then you have to make some cuts elsewhere and um, they work very strategically and I think that they did a very good job. And so some of the changes we did make, if you see on that first budget application, family engagement activities, we used to do $500 per classroom. We just changed that to $500 per site. Um, and then the field trips, we did 46 classrooms at $400. We're now going to make it where we'll pay for two paid field trips and the rest will be free field trips. Children Museum will give us two free field trips a year, and then the teachers can look for other opportunities. Um, we did that because a lot of our districts, Chesterfield and Henrico, also only allow their children to take trips that are free. Um, and the teachers have been doing that this year based on their studies, so we will do two paid field trips, and then the rest will be field trips that will not cost us. So that's where some of the major changes was besides personnel costs with some of the insurance and things going up. And it was the same for our early Head Start. We have less classrooms, only seven. So we made some adjustments where we've given them um, the field trip, well the babies don't take field trips, but bringing things in for the infants and toddlers. And then um, the family engagement activities, we did that per site as opposed to per classroom to save some money. Ms. Ms. Erb. Can you just talk about the impact of the family engagement money change, what that will mean for family engagement? Um, our families haven't been using a lot of that. We get more of families wanting to spend it more on food um, as opposed to actually using it for um, workshops and there are a number of community agencies that we partner with that will give us free workshops so we will use that money to buy supplies for that work those workshops as opposed to spending the majority of the money just on food. Um, Children's Museum right now has a partnership with us they're doing free childcare and free food for all of our parent meetings and if they get the grant next year they'll do it again. So it shouldn't have a huge impact because right now they're trying to use it mostly just for food. So I move the approval of the Head Start, early Head Start budget. Second. It's been moved by Ms. Owen and seconded by Ms. Marsh Carter to approve the Head Start budget. I'm sorry, her early her Head Start. Is it it's both, Head early Head Start and Head Start, yes okay. ma'am. To approve the early Head Start and Head Start budget. Yes ma'am. Okay. Any discussion? Oh yeah. Okay. Want a question? Ms. Dore? Yes. Mr. Barlow? Yes. Ms. Menz Herb? Yes. Mr. Young? No. Ms. Cosby? Yes. Ms. Carter? Yes. Ms. Owen? Yes. Dr. Supini? Yes. Ms. Page? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. The next item is item six, your consent agenda. And Madam Chair, just ask that you approve the minutes at this time. They were presented to you for your review and they were posted to board docs. I have not received any um, changes or corrections. <coughs> Seeing that we have no changes, the minutes will be approved as received. Next item is 7.01, other informational items, and we do not have any at this time. Item eight is new business. session. Pursuant to personnel section 2.2-3711, subsection A, subsection 1 of the Code Virginia 1950 is amended. 
I move that the school board of City of Richmond convene in closed session to discuss prospective candidates for employment and the assignment, contracts, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining, or resignation of specific employees in the division, including consideration of the human resources agenda of this state. I second. It's been moved by Mr. Young and seconded by Ms. Owen. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We're now in close.